Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining one of my uh, regular media availabilities. Um, lots going on, and I want to make sure I've got plenty of time for questions. So let me start at the top and talk about the kind of Rubik's Cube on steroids that the Congress and more specifically the Democrats have to grapple with over the next um, 10 days or so. We've got to make sure that we don't shut down the government and uh, we've got to make sure that we don't mess with the full faith and credit of the United States of America, which is the debt ceiling. And let me be clear what an absolute disaster this would be if our Republican partners don't step up and you know, continue the raising of the debt ceiling. And remember, the debt ceiling is all about paying for bills that we've already incurred. This says we're simply going to pay down the five trillion plus dollars that we spent under the Trump administration that all my Republican colleagues voted for. But if we don't do that, um, what that would mean would be it would shock the markets. You could potentially see interest rates go up. And at the governmental level, uh, if interest rates go up one, one percentage point, that adds to the debt payments we make, $200 billion a year over 10 years, that'd be a $2 trillion of additional spending that we didn't need to spend at the federal government level. For everyday Virginians, if we allow the debt ceiling to be breached, um, you could end up having Social Security checks not go out, Medicare, Medicare checks not go out, our men and women in the military not getting paid. And on an individual basis, your credit card bills would go up, your mortgage payments would go up because uh, interest rates rising for government borrowing ripples through the whole economy. So we have to make sure that doesn't happen. We've got to make sure as well that we pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill, something I was proud to be a part of, that will make record investments, not only in roads and clean water, but also resiliency. We've got a lot of places around Virginia, particularly in Hampton Roads, that needs that additional resiliency. We need to make sure we've got broadband. I commend what Governor Northam has done, but there is a lot more uh, that needs to be done out of this infrastructure bill. And then finally, we have to grapple with how we make our tax code fairer and make the kind of long-awaited investments in childcare and in bringing down the price of prescription drugs, making sure that uh, uh, we've got universal um, pre-kindergarten. So a lot on our plate, all of these are wrapped together and we have to get them resolved um, literally in the, in the coming days. Two other items I want to mention before I move to your questions. One is that <clears throat> I introduced, reintroduced a, 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 an idea that I've been working on for some time yesterday with my partner Tim Kaine, um, both of the, the senators from Georgia, John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock, uh, Senator Van Hollen from, from Maryland. It's called the Lift Up Act. What it does is it says we have too many first-generation, first-time home buyers that are falling behind. You know, one of the reasons why we have a wealth gap in this country that's eight to one white families over black families and six to one brown families behind white families is because they have not had uh, though that kind of access to buying a home. Um, a home is where you can build up equity where you can end up and borrow against if you want to send your kid to college or start a business. And so we, in the Lift Up program, we would provide for qualified first generation, first time home buyers, an interest rate subsidy that would allow, if you can afford that 30 year mortgage, we would actually provide a 20 year mortgage instead. That would allow someone to uh, accumulate equity in their home at twice the rate. This would be a terribly important goal in terms of making sure that we narrow the racial wealth gap in this country, but also make sure first generation, first time home buyers get a chance to get the fair shot that I had in my own life. Something that's really important that we get into this so-called reconciliation bill. Finally, I want to acknowledge that Tim and I and Joe Manchin and others put forward a continuation of the coal excise tax. It was due to expire. We think it needs to be continued because those revenues go directly into the Black Lung Fund. And unfortunately, uh, while the number of coal miners in Virginia continues to decline, the, num the rate of people getting Black Lung at younger, younger ages or retired coal miners uh, 
getting black lung continues to go up, and we've got to make sure we honor that commitment to those miners and their families by providing the, this kind of black lung relief, and that's got to be funded by the coal excise tax. So those are some of the items that are, that are on our docket, and uh, I'll be happy to go ahead and, and move to questions. The first question comes from Kelly Meyer at Nexstar. Kelly, are you there? Okay, we will, um, the next question will be from Rachel Smith at the News and Fan. Hey, Senator Warner. Um, I put a question about um, Biden's path out of the pandemic plan um, and his um, call for the ETS, the Emergency Temporary Standard, which would require employers with more than 100 people to require vaccination or weekly testing. We know that Virginia operates an OSHA-approved state plan covering most private sector workers and all state and local government workers, but just wanted to get, you know, pick your brain on, you know, how would this impact our local businesses? A lot of them have a lot of questions about this. Um, you know, do you approve of this? Um, you know, what is your message to them? My message to Virginians is get vaccinated. You know, we can get the COVID variant and the COVID behind us, but only if we get vaccinated. And I strongly support the president's mandate um, that would include not only public sector workers, but private sector workers. Uh, and I have found the vast majority of Virginia businesses, you know, even the small, smaller businesses that are 100, 150 employees, they support the president's effort. Uh, frankly, in a way, they can blame the president for a decision that uh, they may or may not want to take, but I think they all know that as long as you have people getting sick and large segments of your workforce having to quarantine because they come in contact with people that are sick, we're not going to get this economy back humming. We, we know lots of businesses that can't find available workers. Oftentimes those workers don't want to go back into a setting where other people are unvaccinated. So let's do the right thing. Uh, I think I understand that people have a personal right not to get a vaccine, but that personal right should not extend to harming others in the community. And their failure to get vaccinated, I think there needs to be consequences, and I support the president's approach. The next question you. comes from Randy at WMRA. Hi, Senator. Thanks for your time today. Uh, I was wondering if you had any update on the mail situation in Charlottesville or if you've heard back from the USPS uh, district manager. Yeah. You know, Last month, I went to Charlottesville and met with the new postmaster in Charlottesville, met with the district managers, and got promises that we were going to see an improvement in mail delivery time and service. I know the Charlottesville post office in particular was, was missing about 15 um, delivery carriers out of a, out of a total po uh, group of about 85. That's a huge loss of, of labor. Uh, unfortunately, since that time, uh, we've not seen complaints go down. Um, I am contacting the local postmaster who had only been in about a week, or I'm sorry, about a month, uh, to see what the explanation is. And I'm going to bring this all the way up the chain to the postmaster general at the national level if we don't see improvement. I know it's challenging to recruit workers in the Charlottesville area, uh, but we got to go that extra mile. It is not fair to people who rely on the Postal Service uh, to get their bills paid, to get their medicines, to get key packages, to have the kind of delays that are taking place. And um, it's not a question of funding that's available. We have provided sufficient funding from the federal government. Uh, they just got to operate their system better there. And if uh, uh, the local management can't get it done, we're going to have to replace that management. The next question comes from Angela Jones at the Hampton Roads Messenger. Angela, are you there? Okay, um, we will go to Mitchell Miller at WTOP. Hi, Senator. Hey, um, uh, as you may be aware, uh, we're just getting word from uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer and House Speaker Pelosi. Uh, that there is a revenue agreement apparently in connection with budget reconciliation. I wonder if you could comment on what 
kind of progress you think is being made and your reaction to that? And, and are we, in your view, getting any closer to uh, some kind of top-line number that will not be $3.5 trillion? Well, Mitchell, you know, that would be news to me if the speaker and uh, the majority leader have come up with a, a revenue number. Um, I think we need to get to one. I, I, I was with the president for a couple hours yesterday as one of the more moderate senators. Uh, I believe strongly we need to go ahead and pass a, um, the infrastructure plan that got 69 votes that will make record investments in clean water and roads and bridges and rail and, you know, frankly start the path towards a cleaner energy environment with smarter grid and uh, electric vehicle investments. We also need to take the second step, and I was prepared to go to the f full amount on the so-called reconciliation bill. Clearly, some of my Democratic uh, partners are not willing to go that high. So we were trying to still work through um, what that top line number and then which of the component parts. There was a, a long list of new initiatives in the, um, uh, the proposed $3.5 trillion uh, deal. I think, candidly, not all of those initiatives can be implemented with a smaller amount and, and frankly, I, I think it would have stressed the federal government to try this many new initiatives at once because as a former business guy and governor, you know, the, I know that the challenge just starts when you pass a bill. How you implement that bill, how you get those services uh, to the American public and to Virginians is really where the rubber hits the road. And uh, I think we ought to be targeting uh, the number of new programs we start and make sure we do them efficiently rather than simply do a full grab bag of new initiatives. But I am not aware, Mitchell, of of the majority leader or the, the speaker's announcement. Yeah, I don't think they have an actual number, but they, they did say that there is some type of framework uh, agreement in connection with uh, how it would be paid for. Yeah, I, I would be, um, um, that would be news to me as someone who is very involved and engaged in both not only how we raise the revenue in a way that makes our tax code fairer, but also how we appropriately spend in terms of support for families, in terms of bringing down the price of prescription drugs, in terms of actually having a tax code that uh, uh, where the most successful pay their fair share. Uh, so if, if they've reached an agreement, I'm not sure who that was with, uh, but I'll know sooner. I'll know shortly as well. I'm sure we'll be following up. Thank you very much. Great. The next question comes from Michael Martz at the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Uh, yes, good morning. Um, the, I have a kind of a political question, which is unusual for me, but it, it, it seems that the um, some national politics are filtering down uh, to state-level races, Virginia being one of uh, two states with gubernatorial races this November, and you get the down-ticket down uh, House races. And, and the president's approval rating seems to be... Uh, an issue uh, that is affecting, is based on some polls we're seeing, uh, affecting Democrats in um, uh, in, uh, rate, in in tight rate contested races in Virginia, uh, as well as the governor's race itself. How does the how how important is it for Congress to produce an agreement on spending and on the debt ceiling uh, in order to uh, uh, right the ship? From a, Demo from a uh, Democratic perspective right now. Right. Well, Michael, I, I agree. We, you know, we need to make sure we, we don't shut down the government. We need to make sure that we don't blow through the debt ceiling. Uh, but you know, we're going to have a vote on that on Monday. I'm going to vote to continue the government and make sure that we raise the debt limit. If my Republican friends vote against that, which it sounds like they are willing to do, um, shutting down the government or having the markets get spooked and raising interest rates, which would have a hugely negative effect on our whole economy, uh, would be a disaster. Uh, but it feels like that's the kind of you know, Russian roulette politics they're willing to play. So I do think it's important for the president to show we can keep the government operating and I think get that infrastructure bill done. Um, but I also understand why uh, as we saw in California, the, the nationalization of some of our politics takes place. When you've got uh, the majority of Republican elected officials, at least in the House, maybe not in the Senate, that believe that the election in 2020 was tinkered with and buy into Donald Trump's big lie, 
I think that scares the heck out of reasonable Americans of all political stripes. When you've got, again, Republicans, governors, and those Trumpers who follow Trump, you know, arguing against the idea of getting any kind of vaccine mandate or any kind of ability to keep our kids safe in schools, that is against what the majority of Americans and majority of Virginians believe is right policy. Uh, those are clear, clear messages. And I think as we saw in California, um, when you put that in those kind of stark terms, um, Americans respond. So uh, I listen, I, I wish the Republican Party would get back to being a traditional conservative center right party uh, that didn't follow the uh, uh, the, the wackiness of Donald Trump. But at this moment in time, that's not the case. Well, are, are you seeing, are you seeing the effects of the president, the president's popularity uh, um, falling, uh, playing out in terms of electorate in Virginia? Listen, I think that <clears throat> you've got some challenges around COVID that, that with the variant coming, I've raised concerns about the way we exited Afghanistan, not that we exited, but how we exited. Uh, I think there was some kerfuffle over the situation with Australia and France, uh, but I think the president's popularity will rebound quickly if we can make sure that we get that infrastructure bill done, that we get this commitment uh, to um, investment in families done, that we lower the cost of prescription drugs. I think the president's numbers will come roaring back. Uh, but in many ways, you know, that is incumbent upon, at least at the national level, us, the Democrats, to kind of uh, you know, move to yes, get to yes. That's, that's in our ability to do that. I also think that the, you know, when, when voters are reminded of the choice, and we see this in the Virginia gubernatorial race, where one candidate wants to keep Virginia moving forward and the other candidate is kind of mimicking a lot of the Trumpisms about vaccinations, uh, about the big lie in terms of election integrity. You know, um, that's not a place where I think the vast majority of Virginians, regardless of your political party, want to end up. Okay, the next right. question comes from Mike Gooding at WVEC. Hello there, Senator. My hey, question simply is this. You have been through this game of will it, will the government shut down, will the government not shut down many, many times in the last few years. And just wondering how, how realistic you believe the threat is this time, and then if it did come to that, how stupid it would be. And then my second question is, I, I'm wondering if you've seen this report about the Navy eliminating 500 civilian jobs in the Mid-Atlantic region. Well, let me take them in reverse order. I've not seen the report. I'll get a look at it and and. and give you a comment uh, after I've reviewed it. In terms of, and I've used this term before, but at this moment in time, with all that's going on in the world, with the country finally moving towards getting the vaccination rates we need, um, the idea that we would arbitrarily self-inflict on our country, a shutdown of the government would be stupidity on steroids. And I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, I do think we may go through a vote on Monday where uh, the, Re the Republicans, unfortunately, uh, led by Senator McConnell, will basically vote against keeping the government open, vote to default on the debt, vote to not uh, provide uh, disaster relief to communities that have been hit by storms and, and fires. I think that's a bad, bad vote. Uh, but I think there will have to be a plan B if they want to make that point. I think it would come back and haunt them, but it would be irresponsible for the Democrats to allow, for example, the government to shut down. I think there will be a subsequent vote. I wish we didn't have to go through this political gamesmanship, um, particularly when the shoe was on the other foot and the, there was a Republican president, Republican House, Republican Senate. The Democrats didn't mess with the full faith and credit of the United States because this is all about the debt ceiling. It's not about the keeping the government open. And we all agree we ought to keep the government open. Um, I think it is irresponsible politics. And the sooner we could get rid of this whole debt ceiling charade, not just for this president, but for future presidents, there will be times when there'll be Republican presidents, Democratic presidents. We should not leave this tool. This is like giving a hand grenade to irresponsible politicians and allowing them to pull the pin and say, damn the consequences. 
uh, in a country like ours with the financial markets is intertwined uh, on, on things related to interest rates in terms of the debt we have to pay, $27 trillion in debt. We've got a lot of debt to service. Uh, the interest rates that consumers have to pay on their mortgage or on their credit cards to mess with the full faith and credit of the United States is the ultimate act of irresponsibility and selfishness. The next question comes from Amy Knowles at the Virginia Dogwood. Hey, Senator Warner, thanks for hey. taking our questions. Hey, in Virginia, about 1.6 million kids benefit from the expanded child tax credit, uh, including almost a quarter of a million children who live in poverty. Now, I've heard of a recent push to ask Congress to extend the expanded child tax credit to at least 2025. Um, is extending that credit something that you support? Why or why not? Well, Amy... The child tax credit, particularly when it's refundable, when you don't have to wait till you file taxes, you actually get a check, has been proven to be able to cut childhood poverty in half in this country. And if we have less kids in, in, in poverty, they're going to go to school fed. They're going to have the tools they need uh, in, in terms of not being food insecure or shelter insecure to be better students. That's going to make them more productive uh, citizens, uh, workers, regardless of where they, uh, what field they work in. This is common, common sense. And unlike some of the other proposals, which require a great deal of complexity, we've already shown we can implement this plan. As you pointed out, a quarter of a million kids and their families in Virginia who are living in poverty are getting those checks. So I do support continuation of the child tax credit in a fully refundable basis. For how long is part of what we've got to grapple through on this uh, other package. Uh, but I don't think there's a single easy to implement program that's better about cutting back on child poverty than the child tax credit and making sure it's refundable. Are there ways that we could perhaps means test it a bit more? Absolutely. But this core idea that has already been implemented ought to be continued. Okay. Um the next question comes from Zach at Politico. Uh, hi, Senator Warner. Thanks for taking my question. Um, do you want to comment on the news that uh, President Biden is, is expected to pick uh, Saleh Omarova uh, to lead the OCC? Um, we're already hearing pretty significant concerns from the banking industry because she's been you know, highly critical of banks and has suggested even you know, that the Fed take over you know, deposit accounts. Um, so, so do, do you any concerns there? Well, for you? well Zach, um, to tell you the truth, one, I haven't heard the rumors, and two, I'm not familiar with the individual. So, um, you know, let me do a little bit of due diligence first, and um, um, you know, give you an answer. But I'm I'm not familiar with the individual's background, and I've not heard uh, her name bandied around. I mean, I, I know there are there have been on other areas within kind of the banking sector. Where I'm on the banking committee. This is an area I, I focus on a great deal. Um, there have been names floated that never ended up becoming real, real uh, you know, trial balloons set up. But on this individual, I just, it wouldn't be right for me to comment because I'm not familiar with her background. Thank you. Okay, and I believe we have time for one more question if anyone on the line would like to ask. I'd like to ask about real estate. Um, yes, with the, go ahead. With the low inventory of residential housing throughout the country, do you know if there's any legislation to curb the number of foreign investors purchasing homes in the U.S. and just leaving them empty, not living them, and not reselling them yeah. or renting them? I am, I am not familiar with uh, any legislation. There may be a bill, but it's not something I think that's been taken up about restricting, you know, foreign individuals from purchasing real estate uh, in the United States. I think that's a bit of a slippery slope. I, I do know in, in major cities, um, oftentimes people will kind of try to park their assets in expensive apartments. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't really honestly thought through uh, that question enough to give you a fulsome answer. I do know that in, in the um, in the so-called Build Back Better uh, agenda, there is substantial amounts of investments, you know, literally north of $100 billion, to try to increase the supply of particularly low-income housing. 
Um, we have not built enough low-income housing in this country uh, literally for decades. And when you think about you know, all the businesses that need workers, particularly you know, workers that are uh, uh, you know, on, on relatively low wages, one of the reasons you can't find workers in many communities is they can't afford to live uh, in the communities, uh, particularly if they're at minimum wage or slightly above minimum wage. Uh, there's not housing stock enough and there's not affordability enough. So increasing the supply, I, I firmly support, and we need to focus this on not the higher end housing, there is some of that out there, but on low income housing so that uh, working Virginians can, can actually live close to where they work. And I think I'm going to have to, like, I, I'm getting a flash from Rachel. I, we, we're, we've got another vote that's up, and it's about ready to expire. So, again, I appreciate everybody um, taking a few moments with me today. Uh, it's going to be um, a, the complexity of how all these pieces fit together over the next 10 to 12 days. It, it won't be dull. Uh, and I know it. sometimes folks will say, you know, how does this affect our lives? Will it affect our lives? Because... You know, we got to keep the government open, and no state is more contingent on federal spending than Virginia. We've got to not mess with the full faith and credit of America, which would be an awful sign if we were to do that right now to our adversaries like Russia and China. It would be awful to Virginians in terms of higher interest rates on credit cards, on their mortgages, on the overall government spending to service our $27 trillion debt. We've got to make sure that we get to the president that broadly bipartisan, infrastructure bill that will make record investments, the largest investments in 40 years in roads, bridges, water systems, uh, rail systems, transit systems, uh, re um, reliability and in, in terms of uh, uh, prevention against flooding and other uh, natural disasters, and the kind of broadband investments that uh, we need to make sure every Virginian um, has access to high-speed internet. And then finally, we do need to go ahead and go through the tax reform process and make the kind of investments that I think Virginians want in childcare, uh, in lowering prescription drug prices, in making sure that we really take on the challenge of climate change. I mean, I heard somebody say uh, over the last nine months, close to a third of America has been in areas where they can't go outside as much as they like because of forest fires. A third of America has been hit by uh, storms and, and tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, and flooding. And a third of the America has been hit by record heat waves. Uh, climate change is real. It is now. It is existential. And we would be irresponsible if we don't take it on. So a lot to get done. And how this all fits together is a little bit of a Rubik's Cube. Uh, but I'm confident we will get it done. Thanks, everybody.